this next panel, we're going to be looking at uh, perhaps one of the biggest stories for Western Europeans, sort of, of the last 12 months. But, of course, um, in terms of its, uh, the, the, the migrant crisis related to Syria, this is something that um, started years ago when that conflict first erupted. And we're going to try and look at, obviously, the you know, extra <coughs> extraordinary uh, and often distressing story about the movement uh, of those refugees, but also a bit about uh, the source uh, conflict and the way that the reporting of that issue has kind of spiralled into uh, a kind of political debate um, and also about how do you keep uh, people's attention and also what kind of impact does the reporting uh, of the refugee migrant crisis have upon uh, public opinion and policy making. And we've got an extraordinary, as you can tell, a uh, very rich, uh, diverse group of journalists to talk about that. But I want to kick off um, by, Shereen, I want to kick off by showing a little clip from a, a film that we're showing uh, later today, um, which stars, amongst uh, other Lebanese-based journalists, Kareem here, to my left. So if you can just play a little clip from that. This is just a flavour of journalists talking about uh, reporting on the refugee crisis in Lebanon. So you can see more of that later, but I want to start with you, Kareem. I mean, uh, and welcome, by the way. I'm glad you managed to get a visa to come here this time. <laughs> um, how does it feel, thinking about it, having re reported for so long from there and seeing this story spiral out of control, how does it feel for you? Um, I mean, it's, it's quite amusing in, in Lebanon to sort of, uh, you know, see Europe freaking out about a few hundred thousand refugees because, um, you know, since the crisis began, Lebanon now has one million, over a million refugees who are documented uh, for a population of four million. So that's like the UK per capita getting, you know, 20 million refugees and uh, Lebanon's population is, um, you know, at its projected levels for 2050. Uh, so this is what the population should have been in uh, 30 years. Um, the country's infrastructure has been stretched beyond the breaking point, uh, whether it's, you know, electricity uh, outages, water shortages, um, you know, inability to collect garbage, um, uh, long-running political crises, uh, destabilization of the sectarian makeup of the country. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's been rather, um, you know, schizophrenic to sit and read through, you know, the, the, these long-running debates about should we take in 20,000 refugees or 30,000 refugees or 50,000 refugees when the country's been hosting so many people um, who literally one out of five people you meet in Lebanon is, is a registered Syrian refugee. And it's not something that you can escape from, you know, it's not, they're not living in camps. The Lebanese government doesn't let you build camps because they're worried about permanently changing the demographics of the country. So, you know, if you're out um, at a bar at night in, uh, in Beirut, you know, kids are coming up to you to either shine your shoes or sell you flowers or beg for money or, um, or any of those things. You drive out to the, to the hinterland, to the Beqa Valley, where, you know, all the agriculture uh, is, and, you know, you see these cantons and tent settlements that flood in the winter. And, you know, you, you, run, you run into it every day. It's not, uh, it's not something that you can... Uh, you know, turn a blind eye to or, or ignore for a long time. 
And you speak, um, in the film you speak about how you try to spend time with people, you try to treat them uh, as people, but it must get harder and harder. I mean, you work for The Guardian, it must get harder and harder to, to come up with a, a narrative or a story that will still get you on the agenda. Yeah, so I mean, the, the problem is obviously that this is such a long-running problem. Uh, there's, there's a book by this, um, uh, uh, by this writer called uh, Judith Herman who talks about um, complex PTSD. So it's, it's sort of a, a state of chronic trauma uh, where you know, the, the symptoms get so much more worse than if you were you know, at one point exposed to a you know, violent incident, whether it's you know, domestic violence or political violence or bombing or any of these things. Uh, but the state of, of displacement for so long actually gives rise to something so much more harder to treat and so much more awful for the individuals involved than simply experiencing one wartime trauma. Um, so, so you need to realize that you have to keep coming back and writing about these people. Um, you know, I mean, one, one, uh, one obvious sort of evidence of, of this is the fact that you know, half of all the Syrian teenagers in Lebanon who are, who are displaced by the war have contemplated suicide. Um, that's, that's one of the elements of this chronic trauma that needs to be, uh, you know, constantly addressed. And we can't sort of keep giving up on the story. So we have to keep looking for fresh angles. And, um, and I think, I mean, just one, one way that I approach it is that, um, you know, I grew up in, in, in the Middle East and we grew up with this, um, hero narrative that you learn about when you grow up and, and read stories about the Prophet's companions, you know, and you read stories about, you know, when Islam erupted into, um, uh, into Mesopotamia, into Persia, into Constantinople, into Egypt, and you learn about uh, all these incredible stories of, you know, three, uh, like an army of 300 Muslims who defeated Mecca's most elite knights, and the problem that we have now is that you know, there is no hero narrative. There is nothing really heroic about, you know, going to work and being at a nine to five job and, um, you know, having kids and growing and, uh, you know, retiring at 60. There's, there's nothing really heroic about that. And I think that the lack of that option or the lack of that narrative really feeds into the appeal of groups like ISIS and, and, uh, and jihadist groups that are proliferating around the region. Um, so I think that the, you know, if you actually do talk about the heroes, uh, you know, the, the father who, you know, surrenders his children's fate to the sea just so he can have a better life because he gave up, you know, on, you know, the hope of sympathy, uh, you know, on land, that guy's a hero. You know, the women who are, who are uh, you know, making these ancient uh, Arabani fabrics and, you know, under siege in Syria and smuggling them out to Lebanon to sell them so that they can have, uh, they can make a living, these guys are heroes too. Um, you know, the, the women who are running the vast majority of the households in, of the refugee households in Lebanon, those women are really heroes too. Um, you know, the children who survive cancer and who, are, and who are being treated and survive multiple bouts of cancer, who was, one of them was featured in this movie, she's a hero too. And so we need to write about those <coughs> heroes, um, you know, on a, on a regular basis. Okay. I'll come to Rosalind Warren from BuzzFeed because, uh, in a way, you've been also trying to find... Uh, different narratives, haven't you, to try and, uh, not just because you, you're creative, but because obviously BuzzFeed isn't the BBC. You have a different kind of role, don't you? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, just actually to go off your point about <coughs> the mental health mm. crisis that's actually fast-growing, uh, under-reported issue. Uh, I recently did a story interviewing a 16-year-old uh, Yazidi girl who um, had escaped... Uh, torture and rape from ISIS and she was in London for a visit with a charity and I was talking to her and she was recounting the horrific things that obviously her horrific experiences and um, and you know we see these stories a lot in the media uh, they need to be heard and they need to be told her experiences and the thousands of other girls um, but what you know the charity were pressing on and what she was pressing on was the you know her mental health today and we talk a lot about the, you know, the horrific acts by ISIS, but it's left there a lot of the time, and there's not much done beyond that. And so talking to her, we're talking a lot about her mental health, and actually I was thinking, how can I present this story to an audience that moves it along or tells it from a different angle? And um, ended up uh, adding her on Facebook, and 
uh, we were talking about uh, her use of social media as a means to cope today, uh, how she talks to her friends, how she uses it as communication, and how she, uh, she's 16 years old, she's like any other teenager, and you know, a lot of the accounts of Yazidi girls are, Here, here's a horrific thing that's happened to them and it stops there and you move on and that's the story. But what happens after that? This, th like you say, the refugee crisis is ongoing. It's not gonna, it's not gonna disappear. She's, she, she may have escaped now, but it doesn't end there. And so I did a piece based around how she's coping today and how she, you know, we had a conversation using emojis on, on Facebook and how that, it sounds, you know, maybe trivial, but it's actually the seemingly smaller things like that that really pull out that human element and say, she is like any other 16 year old in the UK. Um, she's talking to her friends using social media and apps or whatever it is. Um, and this is how her life is now. And this is how she's coping mentally. And herself and many others are struck with uh, PTSD, depression, a series of uh, mental health issues. Um, and yeah, I think, I think a big thing is to think how can we talk about these ongoing issues today and how can we make them almost accessible to, especially for BuzzFeed, especially for younger audiences, presenting it to them and saying these are normal people <laughs> just like you and sometimes they're sort of ridden about so distant and um, there's no way for people to sort of really relate. Uh, and so that's what I try and do with my work day to day. And do people respond? I mean, obviously this is a kind of difficult um, issue, but do, you, do your readers respond to that? I mean, um, certainly. I think um, you know I got a lot of messages and the comments were, were spoke about you know it was refreshing to read an account that wasn't portraying her merely as a victim but as a survivor. And I think that's something that we need to do and focus on more and more with the refugee crisis is that these are survivors and they've survived horrific circumstances already and beyond that it's it's we can't just talk about the, the the grief and those horrific events as one thing but beyond that I think that really struck a chord was how she was coping and um, presenting that to our audience who uh, wanted to hear about what what's next I think yeah. we come to uh, Milen uh, Larson from Vice in a second I just want to play a clip from one of your films, because again, it's interesting to see how the so-called sort of new digital platforms are trying to engage people on these these issues. So we can cheer up. How long were you in the camp? Uh, I spent three months in jail. For no reason at all? For no reason at all. Because of what? Because of the war. Oh, and the war. Yeah, because of the war. Why? Because of the war. you and they will ask you to pay money. You will get us uh, back to the world. Thanks very much. Do you want to explain, Melin, the, the, the context of that and um, why you think it was effective? It's part of a whole series, wasn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> I was hoping we'd go to the end of the clip where we actually follow these boys making the first phone call home to their mother because that was the one I wanted to show. Um, so the context of this... This was Kungren Buba. They were two boys from Gambia, 16 and 17 years old. They had just gotten off one of the ships that had been sinking, that had been rescued. It was um, the end of 2014 when Mare Nostrum was ending. So it was one of the last rescue operations. And you would see the news reports, just lots and lots of people, you know, all these words that people are using, floods and so on. And uh, Vice News is an online platform giving us the luxury of not just doing a three minute news reports, but going in depth. So we have a doc approach with the series Europe or Die. So we wanted to see how these young boys actually experiencing arriving in this new country. And they had no idea. We met them outside of this tent city. We're just waiting, trying to figure out how to get in. And they come out and they're completely lost. They don't know they want to call their mom and they don't know how to get into the city center so we walk with them we show them how the phone card works and we get this experience where we see them call their mom for the first time the happiness on their faces and you know when we had the phone call actually translated 
we, we just felt so moved by this. And I think this is what, as Rosalind and Kareem has been talking about, what moves you, this personal human story, is what's often forgotten in the news because the, what we call the migrant or the refugee crisis, which you know, we can discuss the terminology of that, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, um, the, the really difficult thing when you report this is that it's not, it's a very complicated issue. Like I started out with this series looking into it in 2013 thinking it was a matter of, you know, a story that sort of tells itself people risking their lives to get in and the forces tasked to keep them out. And then I realized that, oh no, that's not at all the way it is. It's just this incredible, great bureaucratic gray zone of deterring people from coming in, which is also why this is such a difficult story to report. It's not a story that lends itself easily to sort of clickbait headlines and limited word counts. So it's about thinking about that and trying to be responsible as to not sort of rehash nationalist fear mongering. Yeah. You're, you're, you're taking a very, um, as you just said, very involved, engaged approach to, to the making of that. You've talked about how, uh, how emotion, how moving it was to watch those boys doing that kind of thing. How did your audience respond to that? I mean, does that help to get them to respond? Well, I must say, out of all the films I've done, I have never had such a response as like then reporting on, on this issue because people will actually email, I receive emails every day with people asking how they can help you know, how they can get involved. Then of course, when you read comments on YouTube or on social media, you just feel like we're doomed. <laughs> Humanity is doomed. But uh, that's, well, you can, you can, yeah. You mean because you, you get a negative feedback as well? Yeah, but then you can argue, you know, like when the, the Twitter bot sort of started <laughs> saying very racist things, like are we, I don't know if, if online is necessarily what actually reflects how we think and how we feel, but it's more like a, an outlet to like f opinions that are not allowed in, in sort of the real world, get it, you know, have an outlet. So I think definitely doing things long form, telling human stories and trying at least to look at issues, you know, what, what's, for this um, panel, you ask the question, is, this, is the refugee crisis actually a refugee crisis or is it a political crisis? Having looked into European migration policy or rather the lack thereof, um, it's definitely a political crisis. And I think this is also something aside from human stories that us as journalists should be looking at because um, the culmination of emergency tactics to solve this uh, has been going on for decades and it's not only cost Europe the loss of control of who comes in and out of their borders, but most importantly, it has cost many, 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 many thousands of human lives. So we need to look at how we tell this story in a way that doesn't make it look like migrant problem, crisis, uh-oh, how do we solve this, but also like, why is this happening? How is this happening? How can we make this a better situation? But do you think you're able to do that with Vice? I mean, in a sense, Vice is, your, your films are very emotional, they're very impactful, they were quite dramatic. Don't you think it sometimes just leaves people feeling, wow, they, they, they think, wow, what a, what a story. But it's not full of kind of politicians talking about solutions or experts coming up with ideas, is it? Well, isn't the whole, you know, what we're talking about when you report on, on this crisis, is not necessarily always um, numbers or facts. Like, like Kareem said, like Europe actually is not dealing with that many people when you think about it. So by, there's a lot of sort of nationalist sentiment in Europe, lots of growth of the far right. So <coughs> you need to sort of create with, you know, an alternative to these stories on the ground to say what it's really like for humans, and because it's all about creating a public opinion, right? Well, you shouldn't be a propaganda machine, but you should be there telling what's happening on the ground from the story of human beings so that you have a sort of counterweight to all of this hatred that, is, that you see on social media. 
because yeah. you know you can't as a journalist you, your responsibility is not to to be a politician but it's to provide information and put it into a context that people understand yeah. come to Clarissa Ward you, who you, you're at CNN you, you did this extraordinary series of uh, films recently where you were undercover uh, in, in Syria itself but you've also got previous experience with CBS you know you're a sort of classic um, news reporter in a way and I wonder how you, you, you felt picking up on that last point by Malen, uh, what and you're listening to these people talking about doing journalism especially on this story or this, this series of stories uh, I, I, in a different way how do you respond to that the idea of what your responsibility is um, well, I think that, you know, what, what we're hearing from everyone here is that there's a number of challenges when it comes to telling stories that are vital for all of us, that are hugely important, both politically and simply as a human being. But we all struggle to combat the natural fatigue that kicks in when stories have been played day in and day out on the news when people feel that they've been bombarded with the same images or similar images over and over again, they become a little bit jaded. And I think honestly, as journalists, we often uh, become a little bit jaded too. So I think we all share a common struggle to constantly think of ways to keep these stories alive, to approach them with fresh angles. I think you know it's interesting that we're here with Vice and BuzzFeed because new media is completely changing the way that we change stories and storytelling is changing fundamentally because of that. For me, because I have covered Syria so closely now for five and a half years, I have tried to uh, incorporate in my coverage of the refugee crisis a look at where this all began because this refugee crisis does not exist in a vacuum. It started, and I'm speaking obviously to the Syrian refugee crisis, I understand that there are many people from different countries who are part of this refugee crisis, but for, in terms of the Syrian component, uh, we have a tendency sometimes to compartmentalize in media. We talk about the refugee crisis, and we talk about ISIS, as if these things were born in a vacuum, and they were not. And in the case of both the Syrian refugee crisis and in the case of ISIS, I would argue, they were born uh, in the festering wound that is the Syrian civil war, which has claimed 300,000 lives and which continues to rage on. So my challenge as a journalist most recently, when the Russians became very involved with this conflict and playing a very active role in aerial bombardment was, how do we get back into Syria and tell this story? Because I know that if we can do that, it will bring alive again the stories that we then hear when you people wash up on the shores of, of the island of Lesbos, how much more powerful those stories will feel when we know the bombardment and, and incredible atrocities that they have come from. But we have, and I think this is, you know, we have the, so we have the sort of challenge of overcoming the fatigue that sets in, but we also have logistical challenges. How do you get into Syria? The Turkish embassy <coughs> is still the border. Western journalists are being kidnapped like crazy. You have relentless aerial bombardment from the Russians and the regime of Bashar al-Assad, which is essentially arbitrary. There are no safe areas. So as journalists, we're confronted not just with the challenges of trying to tell these stories in, in profound and compelling ways that keep the public interested in stories that ultimately affect you as much as they affect us, but we're also confronted with the very real uh, logistical challenges of trying to, t and even with the refugee crisis, I remember covering this a year and a half ago and trying to work out the logistics of, of finding a Syrian family and giving them a camera and, and having them capture their journey and then trying to link up with them again. And, gr and by now we've sort of, we've all worked it out, but in the beginning these were, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes essentially that obviously there's no reason most people would be aware of. but. There are a number of logistical challenges that I think have made covering Syria incredibly difficult, incredibly dangerous. Um, and I don't think, just to come back to my initial point, that you can tell the story of the refugee crisis right now without looking at the source. Yeah. And just thinking, obviously, with CNN, you know, you're a global mm. news channel. 
you know, particular strength in, in, in the States. What kind of impact do you think it's had? Because in a sense, you know, the Syrian crisis continues. There doesn't seem to be much diplomatic engagement. Uh, and yet, certainly in Europe, this has been a, a, a kind of massive story, perhaps less so in the US. Um, why hasn't it cut through, do you think? Well, I, first of all, I do think this has been a big story in the US. Um, it took a little bit longer um, to get there, but I did a, a big story for 60 Minutes last April, um, the Syrian family in question that I was talking about, giving them the camera, but we also went out on an Italian Coast Guard boat and uh, were able to see rescues of, of, actually they were Eritrean migrants who were trying to get to Italy. Um, so I do think there's an interest there. I, I think fundamentally two things. Number one, and this is a real misconception that we hear again and again, especially in the US, where there's a lot of pandering to sort of demographics and to data about who's watching what and who's interested in what. Um, and you hear again and again, oh, people aren't that interested in international news, and oh, people find it really difficult. The bottom line is good storytelling is good storytelling. Okay, and it doesn't matter what language these people are speaking and what God they're praying to. If you have a great story, if you have a great character, and if you take the time and the effort to do justice to their story, to tell it in a creative way, to be constantly rethinking the narrative, then you have a great story and people will want to watch it. And I found this with my, I have been told so many times that people are tired of Syria. But when I finally, after six months, worked out how to get through the border and not get kidnapped and not get bombed, and go and do this series of undercover reports, I found the response was massive. There is a hunger, there is a thirst for good, neutral, nuanced reporting that is taking, you know, going the extra mile in terms of trying to think creatively about how to tell these stories. At the same time, of course, the migrant crisis or refugee crisis, however you want to categorize it, is particularly salient to a European audience because this is a European political crisis. Um, and so it is natural, America is an island, well, not quite an island, but sometimes it feels like an island. It is very, very far away from the rest of the world. I think until Americans feel that these refugees could be washing up on their shores, there is a little bit of a disconnect there. Which takes us perfectly to Ana Macera from La Stampa because of course they have been um, if you like, washing up on your shores. And I wondered how, you know, especially listening to colleagues speaking about from different perspectives, from, you know, the Italian perspective, what impact has um, the reporting of this crisis, which is very immediate for you, had? Um, has it made people more engaged and informed, or has it uh, frightened people? Thank you for the question. Actually, yes, I am. Um, first of all, I'm not a um, migra migration correspondent, and so I don't sure. have the experience of the people at this table, uh, and I'm privileged to meet everybody here. I, I'm a public editor, but I, I've uh, talked a lot to the migration correspondents, and I would say the journalists who are, many of them are freelancers in Italy, who are you know following this more as what we call disaster tourists than migration correspondents, in the sense that a lot of, there's a lot of really good journalists who have their heart in this and who go there and try to correspond and tell the story, but they, but they tell it in a way that is you know, passionate and, uh, and beautiful and, and moving and touching, but it doesn't, it, it's, it's moving storytelling without really explaining the politics and without really in, without giving the data and giving context to the data, it's it's journalists who go who go there and uh, and are touched and they feel you know a little bit like what Milan showed this I mean this incredibly moving in, uh, story about injustice that's been is, that happens to human beings, but without the context, readers pu the public reacts in worried or angrily. I mean. The racists are angry and defensive. You know, they're afraid to lose their jobs. They don't want black people to come in Italy. Italians are not used to having black people. And uh, in spite of the fact that we're Catholic, Italians are Catholic, and they're, they were very moved by the Pope going to Lesbos. But, but I mean, if, you know, they saw 
white people there. They didn't see the Nigerians. The Nigerians coming to Italy because they're escaping Boko Haram, that, that's, that's a whole other story for Italians, and it's not true that Italians are that sympathetic to, to, ha to hosting Nigerians in Italy. And actually, we have data of, uh, of migrants coming from Africa. I mean, 54,000 Italians, um, mig migrants from Africa came through Italy. Most of them don't stop in Italy, they just go through Italy. So this whole narration, this whole storytelling of, of people, you know, uh, both people coming to Italy and it's not true. They, they happen to come to Italy because Italy is right in the middle of Europe and that's where you land, Italy and Greece. But I mean, they, go th they, want, they don't want to stay in Italy, they're all leaving. Italy doesn't have any jobs, doesn't offer anything. So it uh, just offers the possibility of going through and going to other countries in the north. Most of them go to Sweden, really. Uh, we have, uh, I saw, uh, I was reading the data from the United Nations, 1.5 refugees every 1,000 residents. And England has 1.8 refugees every 1,000 residents. So that's very different if you think about it. I mean, we could host more. We could really do a better job at hosting people that are coming from Africa, but we don't. And uh, very often we want to distinguish now. I mean, Italy and the south on the borders they want to distinguish between refugees and migrants, and so they don't accept migrants, they send them back. So they only accept refugees. And who is to know who is a refugee and who is a migrant? There's a lot of confusion. I think Milan is right. Language is really important. When, when uh, journalists write about these stories, they have to use the correct words and explain the difference. And we shouldn't make headlines writing clandestines, you know, like invasion of clandestines. I mean, that's the, the clandestines is uh, the illegal immigrants, right? Do you say clandestines in English? Ill illegal immigrants? Uh, illegals, yeah. Illegal, yeah. So huge headlines in Italy wrote about illegal immigrants invading Italy. So these, these headlines are wrong. They're incorrect. So there's a the story has been changing because I think slowly it's improving. But I mean, I mean we've unfortunately journalists had the responsibility of uh, journalists, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the single journalist who's corresponding from there. I'm talking about the whole structure of the newspaper or of the media, of the television show, showing and uh, making headlines that are scary and frightening for people. And uh, you know, if you say if you use the word invasion, it sounds worrisome, right? And it's not an invasion. And actually, Europe could, ho could be more generous in hosting these people. And so I think uh, what's happening in, in Italy right now is that there is a conscience of the fact that the Mare Nostrum politics was better than after Mare Nostrum was, uh, was uh, canceled. And uh, the prejudices are strong. There's a huge, I mean, there's it's, it's, it's a prejudices that come from fear and from ignorance, but the good stories that are coming out and that are explained well have, you know, with, with context, with data, with analysis, and not only emotional feelings, because, I mean, we can't just be emotional about it. We have to give explanations. When the stories are, are written or told in, a, in, a, in an analytical and, and rational way, they're understood a lot better. Uh, I, I see that from the reactions to the stories that I receive from, uh, from the readers at my newspaper. It's a small point of view, but I mean, I talk a lot to the correspondents, and a lot of them say that what there is, there's need for constructive journalism, there's need for something that's less high resolution, because right now it's, everything is high, high resolution photos of Island on the beach, and then there's, no, there's hardly any explanation of why that happened. We need high explanation. Who cares about the high resolution? Okay. That's excellent. I'm going to throw it out to questions, actually, because we've uh, only got 20 minutes. And um, so anybody want to either make a point or ask a question? Let's, we've got one in the middle and one there. How many microphones have we got, by the way? Just, just we've got two. Where's the other? All right. So if you could start that. No, no, oh, sorry. You just take the lady to your right. That's all right. We'll come back to you, don't worry. Mark. It strikes me that um, most of you are saying the strength of media is reporting the human story. And I think this is true of CNN, BBC, Channel 4. A lot of the coverage we've seen on UK TV news is very good at telling the human story, but bad at telling the context. Um, wh why is it that media actually is bad at telling the context? And can you, from Vice and BuzzFeed and so on, do a better job at helping 
place these stories in a wider context. What do you mean by context? Well, just, uh, I mean, I think uh, Anna put it very well, that, that photograph <coughs> was so powerful. Uh, if you ask people in this room, well, what was the background to that story? How did that family come to be in that place? Where did they come from? Uh, f few people would know. We're, we're bombarded with these, these images and testimony um, but the commentary around that, certainly in the UK, is very much um, through the spectrum of politics and politicians and what's Cameron doing? Um, and I find that frustrating. Okay. I mean, I would just say off the bat that, first of all, I think it cuts both ways when we talk about the Eileen Kurdi photograph. I mean, at CBS, we, we did a lot of discussion of who his family was and what the background is. I was and, and what his story Speaking was and the, the larger. Mic, please. Sorry? Speaking to the sorry. microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and what the, you think I had learned to do that by now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think there was a lot of context given in the case of something like Eileen Curdy. I think what happens though, a photograph goes viral in a sense like that, and people just remember the photograph. That's what stays with them. That's what haunts them. That's what they see in their mind's eye. They don't remember that Island Curdy was from such and such a village and that his family is now. It's, it's not that people aren't telling them. It's what sticks somehow. Secondly, I would say that if you're really looking for in-depth context, and I'm probably going to get fired for saying this, but I think that print media, there are obvious limitations to what I can tell you in a three-minute news piece where we're looking at visual images and I therefore have to be explaining what those visual images are. If you want to read, if you want to really get to the grips and get to the nitty gritty of an issue and you want more nuance, um, then I suggest you also, as well as watching my piece, read uh, <laughs> Kareem's, piece, Kareem's piece or read you know, one of Anna's correspondence pieces in La Stampa, because I do think print is in a unique position to, to offer a different kind of context. Anyone else want to come in on that? No? I'll go to the next question then. That's the, that lady there. Thanks. Thanks. So I was speaking to a Syrian journalist last week, um, someone who's still operating out of Syria, and her, her beefs about um, the journalistic coverage of Syria were two big ones, which were, why are journalists interviewing the same two or three people? They're the only people who ever get on, and they're the three people that speak English. What's, you know, why isn't there more than that? Why isn't there more commitment to getting translators and getting wider um, spokespeople? And then her other beef was, uh, why do journalists ask such stupid questions? And the, <laughs> the one that she cited that she gets asked all the time is, so what's better, ISIS or Assad? And she goes, really, like, can we get beyond that? Why, why do I keep getting asked these really, really silly questions? Okay. Um, I'll let back to you, Clarissa, because you're the only person I've who actually reports I've never from asked Syria. anyone that question, <laughs> honestly. And I would also say that uh, in my reason, I use Arabic speakers all the time. I, yeah. I, I, I think, listen, there's no question that having someone speak English, of course, it's, it, it, it delivers a, a different level of, uh, of kind of relatability in a sense. Although if I start to speak to someone and their English is a bit halting or I sense that they're not, I'm like, speak in Arabic, let's have this conversation and have it properly. So I don't, I'm not really sure I agree with her. I mean, Karim, th that's always the complaint, isn't it? That the, the, the people in situ, um, the journalists in situ always, of course they know more than the, the, the correspondent who has to come in and out. Um, that's just kind of, kind of fact of life though, isn't it? But you still have to adapt your knowledge, don't you, to a Guardian audience, which of course is UK and more global, isn't it? Right, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's impossible to sort of uh, you know, get into all of the different you know, elements or, or details in a particular you know, local context. I mean, we're writing for an audience um, you know, in the UK, a global audience as well. Um, people who you know, don't necessarily care about you know, the little tribal differences that led to someone from Nusra you know, shooting someone else from like a rival militia. You know? Um, but, but you're right, I mean, there is, there is the element of, um, you know, you need to really, really learn what's going on. Like, you need to approach it as someone who's, 
uh, you know, there, there was, there's an old joke about, you know, how a foreign correspondent is someone who, you know, flies from hotel to hotel and thinks the most important thing about the story is the fact that he's in it, you know, and, and <laughs> but, but that's, that's, that's not, that's not how you approach it. And, and honestly speaking, the, um, the press corps that covers Syria, you know, on, the, I mean, not exactly on the ground because most of us are not in Syria, but like in Lebanon and, and in Turkey, um, are actually extremely knowledgeable. I mean, people who've been covering the region for the last 10 years, last 15 years, last 20 years, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really incredible group of reporters. And um, I mean, you know, I'm an Arab journalist and I speak Arabic and I, you know, whenever I interview people, I interview them in Arabic, mostly because they think the Egyptian accent is really funny. <laughs> and so, and so they open up uh, a lot easier. But you know what, I mean, the, you know, I don't believe in the narrative that uh, you know, a foreign correspondent can't tell what's going on. Like, a, f a foreign correspondent can actually have, you know, an amazing bird's eye view of the situation and, you know, be able to talk more honestly about some of the problems that we have in our societies that we're not willing to talk about, you know, and that's, and that's not a neo-colonialist, uh, you know, viewpoint. It's just the, the fact of the matter is that there are people who can, you know, contribute an outside perspective that, you know, we can be lacking when we're, when we're introspective about the, about the region and its problems. Right. Um, I must make sure I'm sort of fair, but let's go right to the back there. Uh, not right to the back, sorry. You, you in the stripy top. <laughs> Um, hi, um, I'm here from Amnesty International. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question um, of Milen, uh, and it, it relates really to the kind of responsibility um, that we have when telling the story of an individual. So what struck me about what you were saying, you know, you were, you were um, relating uh, the experience of those two teenage boys um, that you met and how um, you guys followed them when they you know, made that phone call to their mom. And I was thinking about the kind of responsibility we have to kind of preserving the dignity of the people that, that we interview and also you know, to what extent you know, are, are you kind of um, moving into sort of voyeurism in a way because that's a really private moment um, that they're having with, with their parent. I mean, I wouldn't want someone you know, there with a camera in my face when I'm talking to my mom. So I'd just like you to talk a little bit about, you know, the questions that you ask yourself um, when you're about to tell uh, an individual story. Thank you. That's a really, really important question. And actually, this is something I think about a lot. And it is really important to make sure these people have experienced, like people who, who have come to Europe have experienced enormous trauma. And it's often very difficult for them to talk about that. And you need to be aware of this. And you can't just walk up to people with a camera and just ask a really hard question, be there for two minutes, and then leave. So that's not at all what I do. So what turned out to be a um, two-minute clip in the film was actually five hours. We were with these boys. We got to know them. We made sure that, you know, they, you know, we gave them as much as we could in terms of information about Europe, talked about ourselves, talked about them, and so on, and stayed in touch with them on Facebook after, and so on, and made sure that they were, you know, would you be okay with us filming this? And they really wanted that. They really wanted to have this moment, and, you know, asking their, you know, so, so it's really important to make sure that people are willing to do this. And also, in terms of Kungur and Buba, they're, they're minors, so it was also important to make sure that they were aware of if they come, do they want to go elsewhere in Europe? No, they didn't. They didn't even want to go to Europe, actually. They wanted to stay in Libya to work and then go back to their families. They were just put on this boat. And they intended to stay in Italy. So therefore, we spoke to them about this. And you know, would they want, would it be OK to have their faces? And they said yes. So there are a lot of things that go into knowing what you show and making sure that you don't put anyone in a situation that will make them even more vulnerable. Okay, thanks very much. You, you have a similar issue, with you, Rosalind, that you, some of the stories you've done have been very sort of um, personal and difficult. Yes, um, there's a part of journalism is, you know, how much 
involvement do you have with the story and how you know there's you want to tell that human story but at the same time you want to be fair and accurate and, and not involve yourself too much and I think for example the um piece I go back to that my I did a piece which was uh, I was trying to tell the story of the journey as all of us have before I'm at, you know the journey across Europe for refugees um and it was a similar thing in terms of um I wanted to sort of immerse the reader in what that was really like um and I I got in touch with a Syrian refugee who was crossing who I found on a Facebook group who was about to make the journey from Turkey across uh, across to Greece. Um, and we were, I asked to add him on WhatsApp and we were having a conversation and I was going to do almost the sort of classic standard piece of, you know, where I just interviewed him over WhatsApp. Um, but I ended up shifting it and um, it was the first time I've ever really sort of inserted my voice into any of my work. Well, I, I adapted the piece and I made it so it was told through a WhatsApp conversation. Um, and the idea was to, again, like I was talking earlier, to really bring that story to our audience. And all of our readers use WhatsApp. They recognize the format when they're one that most of our readers are on mobile. And it was to try and bring that and piece together our conversation on WhatsApp that all of the refugees that I've spoken to have used WhatsApp or Viber or all of this new technology in their journey. And so it was bringing that element in and making that personal, but still being, you know, fair and accurate in terms of exactly what his experiences were. And also using the availability of, you know, WhatsApp, you could drop a pin and you could see the exact coordinates of where people are. Or you can, you know, he was sending me photos in real time. And I pieced together being like, this is the journey a Syrian refugee gave us in real time. And it was, it's trying to, yeah, that, that's something that, it's, it's a tricky sub, a tricky issue for any journalist is to bring that human story to it, but not make it, you know, as we sort of said about about the journalist or about this that, and the other. It's it's a it's an ongoing issue, I think. Yeah, exactly, eternal. So let's go. I'd quite like to go right to the keep going right to the back to chat. There you go. I um, thought I heard it in a couple of contributions from the panel, the suggestion that, um, that really the, the strictly interpersonal, strictly narrowly interpersonal might be as dysfunctional and ultimately as unhelpful as the kind of outdated, hollowed out register of the traditional political. Um, and I think um, if, uh, if it w I think it was Clarissa that said that um, or the way I interpreted what you said, that the way out of this double deficit, um, these polarities, neither of which really work, um, is good storytelling. Uh, and I think good storytelling is, among other things, a kind of shorthand for um, the question of form. And uh, it might sound a bit self-indulgent. Normally I'd say, in, in other situations, I would have said it would be very self-indulgent of journalists to be thinking about, well, what form should I use to tell the story? But in this particular instance, I think it's become, and I, I wondered uh, what you think about this, I, I think it's become r really important that we try uh, and experiment and try to find a form of storytelling that can go from the poetic, uh, which is where Kareem's heroes are, to the analytical. Um, and I'd be interested to know whether you think that's a, an endeavor worth aiming for. I'm going to take some more questions. That's a beautifully put point. Um, but I'm, I'm going to take some more questions and then get the panel to respond across the board. So if we can sort of run around with mics. We've got a lady in white there. Stories about the um, refugees seem to divide into the threat of the great tide of refugees and the human stories tend to be about vulnerability. I work with people with a history of mental health issues, and I know that vulnerability is not a quality that is admired in Britain. Um, we have the problem of the old people clogging up the health service. We have the problem of the people with mental health problems clogging up the, the mental yeah. health, the <coughs> clogging up the health service. Um, we have the people with the children in primary needing to go to primary school clogging up the schools, the education service. And um, what I think 
would be helpful would be more stories about what immigrants, whether they're refugees or economic migrants, could do for Britain and the rest of Europe at a time when this very morning there was talk about advertising in India for more GPs, advertising um, in the Netherlands for more GPs, um, and what skills uh, the people that you interview could bring to Britain or Very good the point. rest of Europe. So a more constructive narrative, perhaps. Let's take the question. Uh, here or me? Or no, him. He was first. Sorry. You got a nice hat, but he in was... You got a nice hat. <laughs> you got a nice hat, he, but he, he put his hand up first. So <laughs> Thank you for passing it on. Um, first of all, um, I'm, my name's Tom, I work for the Ethical Gentleman Network, and I've been to both the events you put on about reporting on refugees this year, and you've brought together some great journalists who are really putting their heart and soul into trying to tell the story in, um, in, in different ways, in different narratives, and tell it, tell it in, a, in, in an ethical way. What can we do about the rest of the, the press? Um, you've... <laughs> <laughs> Well, obviously, you could just <laughs> well, they, well, that, you know, read these guys' stuff and ignore everyone else. That, that we could, the but problems. then again, this room is probably self-selecting as well. So my question is about yeah. out there, outside of academia, outside of the people who care about the subject that are here, what can we do to improve the narrative, to change the narrative? And if anyone wants to read more about this, please do read our report, Moving Stories, about yeah. international <laughs> review about how media cover migration. Thank you. No, it's a very good report. It's well worth having a look at. So, guys, we've got five minutes. You've got one minute each to respond. There was a theme there about um, how you establish your kind of narrative storytelling. Should it be more constructive? Or, I suppose, the opposite is no, you should just be doing your jobs. So, where do we start? Kareem, oh. one minute each. Um, You've got to be incredibly pithy. <laughs> Okay, um, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really important to be constructive, obviously, but, you know, there has been quite a bit of reporting as to how refugees do contribute to the, um, uh, you know, to, to the countries that they go to, how there are, uh, you know, economic booms, there are uh, new jobs, there's more competition in the places where the refugees go to. I mean, in our coverage, we don't try to portray them as simply, you know, people who are helpless, who, you know, need handouts and who, you know, simply want to... Um, you know, find a way, to, you know, or, or who are extremely vulnerable. I mean, that's, that's not the point of doing it. The point of, the point of the idea of, you know, the hero narrative, for example, is to show that these are people who are actually, you know, struggling really hard to create a good life for themselves, to create a good life for their children and for their families, and that it's not their fault that they were born into, uh, you know, a civil war uh, that, is, uh, that is so brutal and so destructive. Sure. Um, I just want to touch on that point. Uh, I think actually the, you know, the frustrating thing for me as a journalist is that I see time and time again amazing reporting on refugees and the human story and Syria and everything that is of value and I think everyone in this room cares deeply about. But the biggest problem that drives me crazy every day is that these stories are not reaching a mass audience. And it's a... I see it being immersed in Facebook and, and seeing the, the stories that flood feeds and the stories that uh, are shared widely. Uh, that's the biggest problem we face now is that these, you know, we can publish all we want, but there's a, six mini, a page on Facebook with six million, million likes of a short video that's completely false, made up and completely depicting the story incorrectly. And that's being viewed by millions of people. And this happens every day. And we cannot, uh, uh, that's, I, I, don't know how, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know how we can tackle that right. But I think uh, that's the biggest issue that I think we face nowadays. Well, I think there are a lot of good questions here. I'm going to try to answer. So, I mean, the real crisis that Europe is facing is actually not a crisis of migration or anything like that. It's a demographic crisis, so there are definitely a lot of stories to tell, and it's an important question to ask, how can migration be good for Europe? But right now, the problem we have and that we're facing is that it's such a complicated issue. We're not even at the stage where we can start asking this question because Europe is in uh, a financial crisis. Europeans don't have jobs, so if you start talking about how you know, people coming here could provide a new workforce, it's gonna maybe not vibe well with the audience and it's how do you tell these stories? You need characters, you need human stories. And what's happening right now is 
the emergency of people dying, people being stuck in like camps, the Greek Macedonian borders without food or water, you know. It's a it's a question of priorities, about airtime, about, you know, engaging audiences. So that's a big one to face. And it's about what are people interested in hearing as well. There are a lot of things that journalists struggle with, but these are all really valid questions that we should all take on board. Clarissa. <laughs> Um, I would just say that, you know, first of all, there's a difference between journalists as individuals and media, okay, the media. And I think all of us have felt at some time or another that we are sort of like wailing prophecies like Cassandra and nobody is hearing what we're saying because the machine is so much bigger than we are and the machine is fed by what people want to hear or what they think they want to hear. So there is an element of having a bit of humility as a journalist and realizing that like maybe you can't change the system. I think it's a little dangerous when journalists have this hubris and they're like, I'm going to make the world a better place. It's like, oh boy. <laughs> no, you're probably not, but, you know, just do your best work that you can do and make the effort and think about issues like form and be creative and get, you know, get savvy about new media and, and the web and how people are consuming their news and keep your head down and do good work because you, you can't change the world. <laughs> Anna, last word to you. Oh, my God. So make it brief and what spectacular. What a responsibility. Well... There's two great um, constructive journalism projects in Italy. One is uh, called Migranti by Valigia Blue, and the other one is called Open Migration Project by CILD. I think they're here, and I think they're, yeah, gonna they'll be talking they're going to talk about it later on today. And uh, I think there's more questions and answers here. I think there's no way we can answer, but it's true that the, the journalists are in a bigger media context, and media is in a huge crisis, and I think really the public can help the media improve. So I think the public has to do something about it and be active and participate and send in the right questions and the right, the right uh, requests to be better and to improve how we report. Okay. I like that. So with the, we, we've shifted the problem from the journalist to you, the public. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Listen, you get a coffee break now. And as I say, afterwards we go into sort of different rooms, main session back in here. But please thank the panel for an extraordinary session.